Bibles tonight, church, and turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25, and we will read verses 1 to 13 and get into tonight's study of this parable, very famous parable, one of the more recognizable parables, and I'm talking about, of course, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the ten virgins by the Uh, time we come to the end of the next few weeks, (laughs) you'll understand more about why ten and why are they referred to in the parable as virgins and why Jesus uh, taught this particular parable. This is a timeless parable, but I got to tell you, in light of our generation, right now, tonight, think of it, you and I, believer or non-believer, you and I tonight are as, the close, as close to Jesus' coming as any other generation that has ever been right now. Think of it. No one has ever been closer to the return of Jesus Christ than you and I right now. And if I say it again, <laughs> that you and I right now <laughs> are even closer still, it's amazing to think. It is awesome to think. The hope of the Christian is the return of Jesus Christ. So the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 1. Follow along with me in your Bibles. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Verse 6. And at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Nope lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Verse 11. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Amazing announcement regarding the events of the last days. And um, I hope tonight that you understand things a little bit more. We're going to methodically march our way through this. If you're taking notes tonight, jot this down if you would, regarding the parable of the ten virgins. Number one, it's found in verses one through five. And that is, know what you believe. Will you write that down, please? Christian, know what you believe. Know this. It is absolutely critical that you understand what the Bible says regarding this big word, eschatology. Eschatology means the study of of future events as recorded in the Bible. To know this, numerous times in the Bible, either Jesus Christ himself or maybe it's one of the prophets or one of the apostles will write to us and say, don't be ignorant about this very thing. Why? Because as we approach, listen everybody, what I love about tonight's message, by the way, you don't have to be a Christian to agree with us tonight. You just have to have your eyes open. Listen, as we approach what the Bible has recorded, which will be indicators of the last day's events that seem to be held off for a while and people are wondering and people are guessing and questioning, but once the end time events begin, the Bible says they're going to go very quick with succession of time, very fast. In fact, remember when Jesus said in the book of Revelation 2,000 years ago, he said, behold, I come quickly. And you've read that and you've wondered, what? What? 2,000 years is quick? That's not what he said. Unfortunately, the Bible, for us anyway, was not written in English. English is a very poor language when you're trying to read the Bible. The Bible's written in Hebrew and Greek and a little bit of Aramaic. 
When Jesus says, behold, I come quickly, the word in the Greek means, behold, when these things start to happen, man, I'm going to come fast. It's not that I'm going to come soon. He's saying when the end time events begin to tick or click off, when you start to see these things, and you can point the chapter and verse of your Bible and the headline news, Jesus said, I'm coming fast. It won't be long. So this is a tremendous challenge. As Christians, we need to know what we believe because as the world around us begins to question and ask questions and to uh, make fun of or to believe in what the Bible has to say, they're going to come to us for answers and we're to know them. They're going to get their answers from us as we lead them in the word of God. First thing, mark it down if you would, the first two verses. Then the kingdom of heaven, remember what that means, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is interchangeable. It means the church age. From the day of Pentecost to the departure of the church, the church age, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, shall be likened. If I were to tell you what it's going to be like, Jesus said it's like this. Ten virgins who took their lamps went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them, verse 2 says, were wise and five were foolish. Stop right there. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You've got ten virgins in the parable. Jesus' point is to communicate to us, which what he lands on in verse 13 is to be ready. Watch. It's a very powerful word. We'll get to it in a week or two or three. (laughs) The word means to be wide-eyed, vigilant, scanning the horizon. This is the way a believer is supposed to be living in every age of the Christian church. Always scanning current events, knowing the word of God, having a pulse, as it were, on the culture locally and the culture globally. Know what's going on. Now, we've got to fight our human nature to bury our head in the sand. It is human nature to not want to know. We love good news. Don't tell me bad news. And I understand that. I understand that, but Jesus is telling us the good news is what's coming. It's what we possess in our heart, but the best of news is yet coming. Christ is coming back. The Bible says Jesus is going to return, and, but why do we believe this? Oh, you crazy Christians. Well, we are crazy for a reason. The reason is Jesus said, I'm coming back, and so yeah, we're crazy about it. We talk about it. We dream about it. We pray about it, and we get ready about it. It's pretty exciting. But be careful, because God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of not knowing what they should know. I think you'll agree with me that you and I are living in amazing biblical times, and my goodness, the relevance of it all, I don't have the time to go down, but I'm going to run off just a few things. But as the world around us is marching towards a progressiveness, think about it. The world right now thinks it's being liberated. There's a lot of people super happy in the world right now with the way things are going. You understand that? They think things are going fantastic. Well, you may not think so, but wait a minute. You should think so. You should think things are going amazing. You see, it's, per, it's your perspective. If you're looking at the world saying, oh my goodness, all this stuff's happening, isn't it fantastic? Versus the Christian who's looking at the world saying, wow, look at all this stuff happening, isn't it fantastic? Because the Bible said there'd be days like this. You see the difference? One group is saying, Utopia is coming, and it's all around the world. We're looking for super leaders these days, global leaders. We're looking for people, someone, to pull us out of all the earth's trauma. And look, if you know history, that's how Adolf Hitler came into power. He promised the German nation economic recovery and peace and Pride in the German way of thinking, in the German way of living. And the Germans were in a severe depression. It was very, very bad for the German people. And listen, always in a time of deep depression, it is the human nature to reach out and grab onto hope. Grab onto something or someone, and you'll either grab onto Jesus or you'll grab onto this woman or this man or this Uh, gold or silver or whatever, you'll grab onto something for hope. And what we want to argue with you tonight is we want you to grab onto Jesus for hope. Because listen, 
He will never, never let you down, ever. And the great thing is, when the world seems to be at its darkest moment, Christ will come. Christ will return. And we'll talk about this tonight. But biblically, the days and age in which you and I live in right now have been predicted in the Bible. Mark this down, Bible students. You need to remember tonight as we go through this study that in your Bible, 27% of your Bible is written to that topic or dedicated to the topic, I should say, of eschatology, Bible prophecy. That's amazing. Listen, I'm not here to beat up on anybody, but the Jehovah Witnesses do not have 27% of their writings dedicated to Bible prophecy. Same with Mormonism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, none of them. The Bible has 27%. A quarter of the Bible is dedicated to God telling you about the future in advance. And Jesus, by the way, said it this way, I have told you these things before they come to pass. That when they do come to pass, you will know that I am, the ego emi, that I am the eternal God. Wow, that's awesome. Only God can tell the future in advance with perfect accuracy. God doesn't come close. Coming close makes you a false prophet. God hits the nail on the head every time. And so if you're a skeptic tonight, if you're a doubter, and I appreciate that, I respect that, you need to look at this 27% of Bible prophecy. Why should you trust in the God of the Bible? Why should you give him your life? Why should you lean on him for your salvation and forgiveness? Number one reason in my book, it's how I got saved personally. A message not too different than the one you're hearing tonight is that God is a prophetic God. If he's God, and look, I believe this, only the God who knows all things should be worthy of your worship. And God says, right on. That's right. I'm going to tell you, 27% of what's going to happen in the world, I'm going to write it down in my book. And and by the way, 100% of it is everything that matters. So that you can know that I'm the one. That is awesome to think. And I love that. He, um, in a sense, he's pre-recorded his word to us that we might know. Now, this topic gets a lot of people kind of concerned because it either will spawn in you faith or it will cause someone to push back. There's no gray area in this. And, uh, for example, listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 says, Knowing this first. Can you mark this down, church? 2 Peter 3, verse 3. And I'm going to ask you as I read this verse, are we not living in these days? 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first. Wake up, understand something, don't be offended. That scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Or translation, my grandma thought he was going to come back, right? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Oh man, people have been talking about Jesus coming back for so long. Where is the promise of his coming? The word means, yeah, he said it, the Bible says it, ain't going to happen. Scoffers, mockers, making fun of what God has promised. Church, are we living in that age? It is awesome. It is amazing. I've told you before, I want to say it again. You find somebody making fun of Jesus coming back, give them a kiss. <laughs> Hug them. <laughs> give them a Bible. Turn to 2 Peter 3.3 3 and say, man, dude, you're in the Bible. <laughs> right here. Look, it's talking about you right here. It's amazing. <laughs> you're making fun of Jesus returning. Look, this is your name right here. What's your name? Joe? Joe? I bet I know your last name. Scoffer. <laughs> All right. Hi, Joe Scoffer. Listen, Christian, these are crazy days, but when somebody says, oh, man, Jesus is coming back, woo, G- hey, G- give him a hug. <laughs> it's amazing. God's word anticipates this. The point of the parable tonight is not, by the way, regarding pre-tribulation rapture view or mid-tribulation rapture view or post-tribulation rapture view. We'll talk about that in later studies. It's not about various views. It's all about understanding that you need to be ready to meet Christ. You need to be ready to meet Jesus. And it's all important. So know what you believe. It's very important. Luke chapter 12, verse 42. Listen to how important it is for you and I to know what we believe. And maybe I should put it this way. We better know what we claim to believe 
right? Because how can you really believe something if you can't defend it? Now, I won't do this right now. We'll reserve the test later. But what if I were to walk up to you and say, as a Christian now, listen, this is, what, this is fundamental Christianity. If I were to walk up to you and say, can you define for me sin? You should be able to boom, 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 boom. You say, why? Well, because you need to know what Jesus did on the cross regarding that sin. How can you appreciate Jesus if you don't know what he did regarding sin? If I were to walk up to you and ask you, tell me about sanctification. What? Up? Well, then how do you know the power of it in your life if you don't know what the Bible says about it? Are you with me? These are fundamental. These are things that are so basic that to be really a Christian, you need to know what you believe. You need to know and you need to be able to defend it. I'm not saying you need to be a theologian. I'm saying, listen, look, when you see somebody in love, they have spent so much time looking at each other he can say of her, she's got a little mole right there. And when she smiles, there's a dimple there. And you know what? When you look at her, this eye's a little bit more blue than that eye. I mean, he'll tell you stuff ad nausea to you. It's just like T- TMI. <laughs> what? Because they're in love. And they, they study each other. And She'll know his middle name even. And I mean, it's just amazing. Do you remember that show? I don't think it's around anymore, but when I was a little kid growing up, I was just a baby when there was a program called The Newlywed Game. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they would ask questions like, you know, stuff like that. Does your wife, you know, have a birthmark? And they start, it's all very funny and all this stuff, but it's pretty bad if the guy's married to his wife and the guy gets the wrong answer. He holds up the answer and it's the wrong answer. What's your wife's middle name? Oh. <laughs> Not good. As a Christian, you should know what God has done for you. Why? Because someone's going to ask us, what makes you a Christian? You better have the answer. <laughs> Jesus said, or the word of God says, my, peri- my people perish, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So this is very, very important. Okay? Luke 12, 42. And the Lord said, who then is a faithful and wise steward? Who knows how to govern their life? whom his master will make ruler over his household. He's talking about when he returns. To give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find him so doing when he comes. He's talking about himself when he returns. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, notice it doesn't come out of his mouth, it's in his heart, it's his doctrine, it's his way of thinking. My master delays his coming. I don't think he's coming back soon. Notice the result of that kind of thinking. He begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour when he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. It's important about this statement Jesus makes. Now listen carefully. Are you listening? Jesus, this word in Luke 12, Jesus is not saying that this person was a believer and goes to hell or gets lost because uh, something happened. What's here is that there's a person who says they believe. They're in the gathering of the True believers, they look like a believer, they might talk like a believer, but they're not holding, listen, they're not holding truly in action the doctrines of the believer, the teachings. You see, it's, he says in his heart, I don't think my Lord's coming back. You notice that? He looks just like us, but he's not excited about the Lord's return. He could care less. And how would you know? Well, I don't know unless you follow him around town. And if you followed him around town, look, he begins to be very, or he is very sloppy about his witness regarding Jesus. He's living like the world. He's violent. Look, Jesus said that person's very slack. They beat people. uh, They're mean. They're drunk. They're living for themselves. Now, you might sit here tonight and say, well, I don't beat people and I don't get drunk. 
Well, it, fill in the blank. It could be that you're so impressed with yourself that there's no room for God in your life. It could be that you're trusting in your money. It, it, no place for God, okay? Very, very important. Jesus is not saying someone's going to lose their salvation. This person never had it. I've been convinced personally, you guys, in Scripture that, now I know this may raise some eyebrows, but I got to tell you, it's my personal experience, and the more and more I see people, I'm convinced from Scripture, not from my emotions, that one of the great hallmarks of who is a real Christian is that they believe and they understand what the Bible says regarding Jesus' return. They're excited about it. I can't imagine any person saying, man, I don't want Jesus to come back now. Now, look, I understand. If you're, if you're engaged in your weddings next weekend, I understand. That, guy, that guy's praying, God, give me one more week. Will you just one more, wait for one more week? I always tell the groom right before we walk down the aisle, man, let's pray, brother. Okay, Lord, bless us. And, oh, Jesus, come back, to, come back even now. And you can see the, 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 the groom, the husband-to-be never says amen. <laughs> you, you can feel him. You can feel him like, and I'd like to add to that prayer, Lord, just give me one night. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but the believer wants Jesus to return. How can you say you're a believer and you're drawing up excuses and hoping he doesn't come back? Now, I know this, this big spiritual response is going to be, I want my friends to get saved. I understand that. God wants your friends to get saved more than you do. Let the timing be in God's hand. You be faithful. You pray for your friends. You share Jesus with them. But come on, let's get out of here. I mean, let's, let's blow this place, right? He knows what he's doing. So get excited about his coming. It's an exciting thing to think about. First John, now I'm going to give you a bunch of verses. You ready to write these down? 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. You ought to circle the word us. This is serious. By the way, John is speaking to believers, only believers. So how beautiful is this? John's saying, wow, has God loved us big time or what? That we, you ought to circle the word we, should be called Children, you ought to circle that word, of God. Woo! Therefore, the world does not know us. Isn't that true? They think we're, they think we're from Mars. <laughs> because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be like. Pause right there at that comma. Will I have red hair in heaven? Will I be taller? You know, what will I look like? The Bible says we don't know what we're going to look like exactly. But it's heaven, hello. We're going to look cuter than what we do now. Thank God. It's going to be an upgrade. I don't think anybody's going to walk around heaven and how do you... That guy's as ugly as sin. Oh, wait, we're in heaven. There's no, <laughs> right? Not going to happen. We're all going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. Miracle. But it doesn't tell us how we're going to look. It does not yet been revealed what we will be like. But we know this, that when he is revealed, there's a hint. The moment he reveals himself. Now, look, listen, everybody, Bible students, this dovetails with all other scriptures of the prophetic revelation. We know this, that when he's revealed, we will be like him, right? Look at it. For we shall see him. We'll see him as he, listen, when he comes in that instant, we're going to be changed. We'll talk about this in a moment. You see, well, Jack, he hasn't come for 2,000 years it could be another 2,000 years. It's not going to be another 2,000 years. There's no way. Well, how do you know? One very important clue. The nation of Israel was born a second time as a nation on May 14, 1948. And Jesus, the scriptures throughout scripture announces that in the last days before he returns, Israel will be brought back from all the nations of the world into their ancient land, their ancient dwelling place. Think of that. Israel's been there now. How many years? 60-something years now, right? Think of that. 
There's a lot of other things that we could talk about. We're going to be speaking more in depth on these things that come the month of September. I encourage you to be here to learn from all that. But we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, and everyone who has this what? Hope in him. That's notice, capital H. The Lord purifies himself. What does that mean? Stay away from stuff that's going to hurt your walk with God. If Bubbles comes up and says, hey, what are you doing, handsome? Run! <laughs> if you can't handle your computer, throw it in the pool. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. It costs 1200 bucks. I would rather pay 1200 bucks and throw the computer in the pool than mess up your life. And let me tell you, if you're married and you're messing around on your computer... Looking at things you ought not to be looking at? If you're, hey, if you're married or not, you shouldn't be looking at that stuff. Let me tell you, throwing the computer away is a lot cheaper than a divorce attorney. Get it out. Because you know what? The, that awesome verse says, because the Lord's coming back, you don't know when, but we're so excited about being like him that we know that he could come back at any time, and we're waiting, and so that keeps us from getting into trouble. Imagine, just imagine. Now look, I, I am sure this could get on the internet and people edit it out and change it around and make me say things that I'm not saying. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? What I'm saying is, let's pretend what if you knew Jesus was coming back at 3 o'clock tomorrow. I did not say Jesus is coming back at 3 o'clock tomorrow. I say, let's just pretend. What would you do right now? I know what I would do right now. I'd shut this service down. Because most of you are already saved. And I would do what I should be doing anyway. And that is going all up and down my street, knocking on every neighbor's door, just like you would if there's a fire. There's a fire! Get out of your house! I should do that anyway, right? Jesus is coming back three o'clock tomorrow. Okay, come on. Like, believe in him, right? But shouldn't we have that? Understand? Look, the Bible teaches he could come in a moment you're not even aware of. And one of the great indicators of the last day's events, one of them is Israel's back in the land. Not to mention global economic collapse and the dissolving of borders. That's, that's internationally. You know that's going on? And the Bible warned about that? Amazing. The Bible also says in the last days before Christ returns, people will trust in gold and silver. Do you know, no, you just got that from a commercial on TV. No, that's in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? We're so used to it now, Jack. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, I got that. Yeah, Bible prophecy being fulfilled. It's true, man. It's amazing. It's awesome. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Listen, Jesus is coming back. Get ready. It acts as a purifying agent to the believer's life. I mean, look, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not picking on anybody. I don't know anybody regarding this, but if somebody said to me, I'm a Christian, and I don't think Jesus is coming back, you know what? I don't want to hang out with you. I mean, you and I are going to be in heaven together, and all that's fine, but you know what? If you don't, if you're not, if you're not excited, you could be, you could get in trouble. You know? You could get in trouble if you think he's not coming back. Who said it? Jesus said it a moment ago in Luke's gospel. You start to slack off. Be ready. Now, I know some of you are thinking, man, this is a quench. You're quenching me. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. <laughs> but have you read the Bible? Thou gets to do. Thou gets to do. Thou gets to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> and by the way, the stuff that's thou shalt not, if you notice all the stuff that thou shalt not, the, the, the thou shalt not, if you follow it all the way through, uh, it, it kind of goes like this. Thou shalt not do this, so thou shalt not get shot in the head. Right? Thou shalt not do this, so thou shalt not wind up in jail or go to prison all your life. <laughs> Think of, oh man, he's, God's quenching me. He's trying to keep you out of hell and death and the prison and everything. Yeah. Think of that. It's awesome. Another verse. Are you writing these down? Yeah. I worked hard to get these verses. You need to write these down. <laughs> Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope. This is awesome. Be vigilant, scanning the horizon for the blessed hope. Hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, who? Jesus Christ, says the Bible. The Bible says, look for him. Be looking for him. Watch for him. It's awesome. It's glorious. Now, church, 
this parable that we're going to eventually get to <laughs> is about the coming of the Lord. And it's probably good. I'm going to need all of you to look at me because I'm not smart enough to communicate it to you. I've got to show you. Jesus' first coming, okay, you're going to have a crash course in eschatology right now. Jesus' first coming, according to biblical studies, is we would normally say in the manger in Bethlehem. I, okay, you're close. Officially, his first coming was on Palm Sunday week when he was presented as king on April 6th, 32 A.D., it was a Sunday morning in Israel. That is where he visited his temple. Do you remember that week he turned the money changers over and he yelled and shouted, my house, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Remember that week Jesus announced, I am the light of the world. Jesus then announces, I am the bread of life. Remember when the priest would pour the water out of the urn down the steps of the temple? Jesus st stands right there when that's going on, and Jesus shouts to the people and says, I am the living water. All of these things going on that week. It was his first coming. If you were in a seminary course and the professor asked you, what or define, describe the first coming of Christ, you would say Passion Week, Palm Sunday. This was his first. It's when he presented himself to the nation, and it's the only time in Jesus' ministry career where he allowed worship to take place publicly. Every, every time before that, he kept it quiet. Remember that? That's his first coming. His second coming, listen, his second coming, hasn't happened yet, his second coming is to the same location, Coming back, same direction. He's not riding, read the fine print. First time he was on a donkey. Remember? The second time, Revelation 19, he's on a white horse. Okay? And the first coming was as Savior, Messiah. And the second coming is as judge, as king. Okay? And uh, it's awesome. His second coming is when Christ returns again to not only Israel, but to terra firma, literally, the earth, ground. Are you with me? Yeah. He will go through the eastern gate, or the golden gate, the one right now that is on CNN, that's sealed up, it's all bricked up. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, when Christ returns from the atmosphere, from the heavens, he's going to blow that gate wide open. That's going to be a neat day. That's going to be awesome. He's going to go through that. He's going to establish his kingdom, the Bible says, for 1,000 years. The political reign of Jesus Christ. It has to happen. He has to sit on the throne of David. He's never done that. And throughout Scripture, eschatology, Bible prophecy, declares that the Messiah, Savior of Israel, of the world, must sit upon the throne of David. Tonight, Jesus is sitting on the throne of his Father in heaven. He's got to sit on an earthly rule throne in Jerusalem, the throne of David. Yes. That is awesome. The cool thing is, do you remember when David said, the Lord said unto my Lord? Yeah. You know what's awesome? I'm going way off notes here. We're in trouble. <laughs> read the book of Ezekiel. It'll freak you out. It's awesome. And if you've read it, you remember, who's this prince? Who's this prince? Who's, when Jesus is on the throne for a thousand years, there's some prince also that's with him. Listen, he, David said, I saw the Lord, and the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at the right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Yeah. David, in the millennium, is the prince of the king. Da Jesus sits on the throne of David, his genealogical bloodline, fulfilling Bible prophecy. Jesus is the king. David is the prince the Lord said unto my Lord. It answers the commentary on the Bible perfectly. It's so exciting to see that. It's going to happen. You're going to see it. You will, if you're a believer, if you're not a believer, you're not going to see this. <laughs> We're talking about the rapture. We want to focus on what could happen even now. So 1 Thessalonians 4. We're going to run through this together. I want you to listen to this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. 
But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concern, concerning those who have fallen asleep or died, believers who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For, watch, get your pen ready, for if we, circle the word we, these are the famous five we statements of Paul. You might want to write that down. Paul's famous we statements. And I'm going to tell you why they're famous. Verse 14 is one of them. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who, allow me to say it this way, died in Jesus, okay? Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that, number three, we who are alive and remain, excuse me, Paul, what? Paul, are you listening to everybody? 2,000 years ago, the apostle Paul said, we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, what is he saying? Paul believed Jesus could come back in his day. And he's excited about it. Are you? You're 2,000 years closer. will uh, remain until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. Why? How come? What's that? Verse 16. For the Lord himself, not an angel, the Lord's coming, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Don't confuse this with the trumpet of the angel in the book of Revelation. The trumpet of God, there's two of them. I'm giving you more information than what you need to have. One trumpet of God calls the nation of Israel together. The last trumpet of God, the second one, calls the church together. Don't confuse this trumpet of the Lord here with the trumpets of the book of Revelation. A lot of people do, and they get all goofy. Those trumpets are blown by angels. This is the trumpet of who? The Lord, the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. That is, their physical bodies will come out of the ground. Who? The Christians. My uncle got bit by a shark. He was a believer. What's going to happen to him? He's coming out of the ocean. He's going to come out. By the way, just because you can't see Uncle Fred because he got you know, bit in Australia somewhere and there's pieces of him fragmented all over the oceans, just because you can't see that doesn't mean that, he, uh, that his body parts uh, haven't ceased to exist. They're, they're, they're dust, they're, they're wet, but they're dust. God's going to speak, and I love this, because God is the great, perfect biologist, engineer, designer. I mean, look around you. He's going to shout, the trumpet's going to go, and the de- those who died believing in Jesus, listen, their bodies have to come back together. The Bible says they'll be glorified in resurrection at the same moment that the Lord, when he comes for the church, I'll read it in a moment, he brings those who have died in Jesus. So look, if your Uncle Fred, or whatever his name was a moment ago, got, got eaten by a shark in Australia, his body's floating around somewhere, but the moment he died, the real him, the part that makes you move, this part, <laughs> went to be with the Lord instantly. The Bible says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. That fast. We may hold your funeral here, but you're not here. People come up, oh man, dude, I'm going to miss you. I understand the emotion, but he can't, he's not here. It's just a turtle shell, so to speak. The turtle's gone. It's just the shell. He's with the Lord. Okay, this body was built for this world. The part that animates you and drives you, that's the spirit of who you are. That's the soul of who you are. When Jesus comes back in the rapture, he brings those. He's going to bring my mom, my sister, my Dad, and your loved one who trusted Christ, he's going to bring them, and their body is going to be resurrected in glory. And it's all going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be walking around, and this, and there goes Uncle Fred. What? what? And we're, the Bible, look, we're going to be right behind them. Watch this. It says, verse 16, for the Lord himself to send, um, archangel, verse 17, then we, that's the fourth we statement of Paul, then we, notice, not them, Paul is speaking of himself, then we who are alive and remain shall be, there's that famous word, raptured, caught up. In Latin, it's the word rapture. Raptured together with them in the clouds. And it's not a cloudy day. People are like, oh, it's a cloudy day. The Lord could come back. This is, his own, this is God's glory. He's going to bring it with him. <laughs> to meet the Lord in the air. Notice we don't meet Jesus on terra firma. 
That's not the second coming. Church, listen. The rapture is not the second coming. The first coming, he comes to the temple. The second coming, he comes to the temple in Jerusalem. The rapture is in between the first and the second coming. The rapture and the second coming is at least seven years apart. Probably longer, I'm guessing. I don't know, but at least seven Two physical appearances to planet Earth, one an atmospheric arrival to receive us and then back. Where did I leave off? Verse 17. Keep going. Verse 17. And thus, number five, we shall always be with the Lord. Verse 18. Are you with me? Therefore, when you think about Jesus returning, freak out, foam at the mouth, and cry like a baby. No. No. It says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. What does that mean? Expect him to return. And it's going to happen. We're not going to know the the day or the hour. We're not going to know. As Christians, we're not going to know the day or the hour. That's why you need to be ready. Jesus said this. He's the one who introduced the rapture. John 14, 1. Sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4. Jesus in John 14, 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I love this watch. I go to prepare a place for you. Thank God he didn't go down the street. He didn't go to some island someplace. He didn't go to, you know, I don't know. As much as I love Maui, he didn't go to Maui. It's not some secret place out in the ocean, hidden away that no one's ever discovered. And he's pre- no, he went back to his father, and he's been, pre- he's been preparing a place there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. It's all about him picking us up and taking us to heaven. Look at Luke 21, 34. You okay? We're almost done. I mean, we're not, we're we're almost out of time. We're not almost done. Luke 21, 34. Jesus said, be careful because your hearts could be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life. Anxieties of life. Wow. Man, isn't that a plague of our generation right now? Tension, stress, Anxiety attacks, nervous breakdowns because of everything happening. Wow. Don't you love the Bible? It's awesome. And that day will close in on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Watch this. You say, well, there you go. No, no, there's no hope for us. Read verse 36 and be quiet about it. <laughs> be always on the watch and pray that you may escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the son of man look at verse 36 that is awesome yeah all this stuff's coming but jesus said don't panic go to verse 36 pray that you are ready to escape all that stuff that's coming i'm going to give you very quickly the famous five passages of deliverance in first thessalonians 1 Thessalonians, it's amazing. Paul, he's only there for four weeks in Thessalonica, one of the oldest cities in the world. Still, it's still going today. He, he's there for four weeks, and he teaches them about the security of their salvation and the return of Jesus Christ. That's awesome. Are you ready? There's five of them. You guys okay? Okay, number one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The word wrath is tribulation or indignation. God's judgment on earth has nothing to do with hell, has nothing to do with anything else but God's indignation on earth. What does it say? Number one, he's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. Christian, you will not go through the tribulation period. The Bible says so. You cannot experience the wrath of God. It won't happen can't happen. Number two, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Number three, 
Chapter 3, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians. So that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Remember Uncle Fred that got bit down there in Australia? He's coming back. His body will be resurrected. In that moment, you and I will be meeting them in heaven or meeting them in the atmosphere. We just read it, number four, we just read it a moment ago in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Number five, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 9. Listen to this. Oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. You won't need me to tell you a thing. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Listen. For when they say, not we, when they say, peace and safety, gosh, things are going great. Isn't it fantastic? Things have never been better. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Have you ever seen a pregnant woman when that first one hits? It's like, uh, get the car. Yeah, but honey, we're right in the middle of the movie. Get the car! (laughs) And they shall not escape. But notice they. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not in the night or nor nor of uh, darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, be vigilant. For those who sleep, sleep at night. For those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, put it on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Why? For God did not appoint us to wrath, indignation, judgment, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome or what? Don't let anyone tell you, Christian, oh, you know, nobody knows, like a thief in the night. Dude, talk about yourself. Don't lay that on me. (laughs) Paul said, concerning the times and the seasons, you won't need me to tell you anything. Church, this is awesome. Are you with me? No man knows the day or the hour. But the Bible says right here, concerning the times and the seasons, every Christian's going to know it. What does that mean? We're going to feel it. Something's going on. I've looked at the Bible. This is what's happening in the world. Something's cooking. Won't be long. Well, what day? I don't know. What hour? Who knows? But the times and the seasons, it's like, think about it. Four times a year, the seasons change, and you can feel it. I know we're having a heat wave and all that stuff, but man, were you up early this morning? It was cold this morning. And it kind of felt like fall in the middle of summer. Made me think about that. Jesus said in Revelation 3.10, because you've kept my commandment to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the face of the earth. Isn't that awesome? It's amazing. We have so much more to go and so little time to to do this. Um, What we'll do, we'll bring some of these other verses over to next week's study, but um, let's let's end where we uh, we started. Um, In 2 Peter 3, verse 3, do you remember that? It says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. Remember the guy that you're going to go give a kiss and a hug to? (laughs) You stupid Christians. You've been talking about Jesus going back forever. Just get. You're fantastic. Keep talking like that. You're fulfilling Bible prophecy. It makes me just get all excited. Well, you guys... There's a movie either out or coming out that I do not want you to go see because I don't want you to give them their money, uh, give them your money. And frankly, I don't think you should see it anyway, but that's not my business. This is... But there's a movie coming out called uh, Rapture Palooza. Have you heard of, anybody heard about it? Raise your hand because I need to kind of take a little poll here. Like about maybe 10 of you have heard about it. That's a good thing. It stars Hollywood star people. I don't know who it is, but they're people that people know. And um, the, the movie supposedly begins with um, some girl saying, man, everything's been messed up since the rapture happened. I mean, look at all this stuff happening. And like Satan's walking around, tempting people and drinking and, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And there's big fireballs falling from the sky, killing people. And they're laughing about this and that. And, and then at the end of this tribulation period, Jesus Christ is returning 
and some uh, star in the show uh, accidentally shoots off his gun and kills Jesus in midair and falls, falls to the ground. Man, do I kill Jesus? And everybody's laughing and carrying on. And it's called, the movie, it's, it, it's a big stars, and it's coming out of Hollywood, of course, and it's called Rapture Palooza. Now, listen to this for a second. When I, when I heard about this, um, the first thought that came to my mind was, what, I'd like, what a bunch of cowards. Because if they really wanted to be cool, if they really wanted to be uh, hip and fun and cool and crazy, then they should have done something about Muhammad or uh, Allah. Of course, they'll never do that. Because uh, they'll all be dead by morning. <laughs> right? But they can pick on Christians because we don't riot and we don't cut people's ears off and stuff like that. We just don't do that. Why? Our God doesn't need to be defended. He's, he can take care of himself. But my, but my point is, isn't it amazing, with all that's going on in the world right now, that Hollywood's coming out right now with a movie called Rapture Palooza, making fun of the return of Jesus Christ. And my next thought was, that's awesome. Because <laughs> Jesus said, there'll be days like this. There'll be days like this, my Jesus said. <laughs> You can close your Bible. In fact, you can stand right now. Why don't you stand? I want to read to you a hymn. Kind of. It's a little bit of a parody. One of my Bible expositor heroes is a tremendous man of God by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse. If you ever find a Donald Gray Barnhouse book, buy it. Donald Gray Barnhouse. And Donald Gray Barnhouse loved the understanding of what is called the doctrine of imminency, meaning the scripture teaches Jesus is going to come for his people without warning. Unlike the first coming where there were hundreds of scriptures, and unlike the second coming where there's hundreds of scriptures that must be fulfilled first, there are no preceding fulfillments for the rapture to take place. Could happen tonight. It's awesome. By the way, first coming deals with the nation of Israel. Second coming deals with the nation of Israel. The rapture deals with the Gentile church. So Donald Gray Barnhouse, there's an old hymn. It's called, Is It the Crowning Day? And it goes like this. Jesus may come today, glad day, glad day, and I would see my friend. Dangers and troubles would end if Jesus should come today. Glad day, glad day. Is it the crowning day? I'll live for today, nor anxious be. Jesus, my Lord, I soon shall see. That's only if you believe what the Bible says about Jesus' soon return. If tonight you're saying, well, I, don't, I think I'm going to get raptured at the end of the tribulation, and I'm going to look for the Antichrist first. Listen to this. That hymn won't work for you then. <laughs> so Donald Gray Barnhouse rewrote the hymn for those who don't believe that Jesus could come at any moment. This ain't the crowning day. Jesus cannot come today. Sad day, sad day. And I won't see my friend. Dangers and troubles won't end today because Jesus can't come today. Sad day, sad day. Today is not the crowning day. I won't live for today and anxious I'll be. The beast and the false prophet I soon shall see. Sad day, sad day. Today is not the crowning day. Where's the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of your great God and Savior if you don't think he can come back any moment? Father, we thank you for your word. It is awesome. It's so illuminating and at the same time for some shocking. I love the fact that it's more current than tomorrow's newspaper. And I pray, Father, in this place right here right now or those that are watching right now that Maybe your Holy Spirit is speaking to them and letting them know that there's a deep sense of anxiety in their own heart that they may not be ready to meet you if you came tonight. And if that's true, you don't even have to come tonight for them. They could die right now and them not being ready, still true nonetheless. Lord, I pray that you would speak and convict and lead and guide right now. Friends, tonight, if you are doubtful or wondering or a little bit scared about Jesus' soon coming, 
That's the Holy Spirit, that anxiety, that tension. I want you to know you feel that right now because that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you internally that you need to get ready and you're not ready. So right now, right where you're at, you can say, Jesus, this terrifies me and I don't want it to terrify me. I, I, I can't say it's my blessed hope, but I want to be able to say it. I'm asking you, Jesus, to receive me, my sins, my life, my lustful thoughts, my anger, my temper, my my whatever. And I ask you, Jesus, to take my sins from me now. You died for them on the cross, but I need your forgiveness appropriated to me. I give you my sins. I confess them to you, and I want you to change my life. I want you to take control of my life, Jesus. Reveal yourself to me. Be so real to me. I open my heart to you now. I've had, I've had other relationships. I have relationships now. But I don't have one with the living God. And now, Lord, I ask you to come into my life. In Jesus' name.